this presentation the way I'll end it, which is this phrase. And I walk around, so I apologize. You are only as healthy as the environment around you. Three decades of public health research and practice has come to a very simple conclusion, which is that among the many social determinants of health, place matters. How you get from A to B, your neighborhood, how you access goods and services, more than a lot of other things that we may think impact our health, make your health outcome better or worse. So I wanted to start this, this presentation out with this simple phrase. This represents, again, three decades of good, solid research. Well, this other research that I'm speaking of revealed some pretty significant things. And this is when I say social determinants of health. This is what I'm talking about. Turns out, only about 20% of our overall health status can be attributed to the quality and accessibility of medical services. So we are very blessed in our region. We have an overabundance of quality health care. But guess what? That only accounts for about 20% of our overall health status. Critical would never, you want, I don't want to be saying the public health guy said hospitals aren't important, they're very important. Um, but they aren't probably as important as you thought they were, potentially. The, actually, the biggest driver of our health status is our socioeconomic status. And I think most of us in this room can think of lots of reasons why that is. But there are two others that play a critical role. One is healthy behaviors. So the choices we make. And again, no judgment on the chocolate loose, but we're going to eat the chocolate loose. Okay, that's a health behavior choice. How many of us exercise as much as we want? You know, we all know that fitness facilities, their best business of the year is right after New Year's. And then it drops off precipitously from there. So the choices we make about our own health, how often we see our primary care physician, what kind of food do we eat, how active are we, how much time do we spend in our cars, decisions we make every day have a huge impact on our health. That's probably not a shock. But the last piece over there, and I'm not even going to attempt this because there's, I'm sure, a laser pointer on here, but physical environment is 10%. So where we actually are born, our zip code, plays a role and when and where and how we will ultimately leave this planet. So all those four factors tie together. And this is where we spend the billions and billions of dollars that we have to spend on healthcare in this country. Does anybody see a disparity in there? Where are we spending our money? We spend 88 cents on the dollar of every healthcare dollar in the United States on medical services. Does medical service equate to 88% of our health? It does not. We spend 4% trying to get us to make better health decisions. So that's our health insurance companies that try and get us into wellness programs. Maybe a work site has a wellness program to help us make better choices. That's about 4%. And only 8% go to the, all of the other things that we know impact health. So this disparity, I'm going to say that word a lot, disparity. So the unequalness, that is not a word, but I just made it up, has equaled something that we have a real, real problem with. Because we don't spend our money on what actually makes us healthy, we have an obesity problem. But it's more than just obesity. Uh, I hear you hear that a lot in public health. I mean, how many of us have heard we have this problem in the country? Most of us. Well, what do you do about that? I mean. Me as an individual, how do I combat obesity? That's a huge thing. But I think it's important to start with this because it helps to illustrate and prove the point of why we have to maybe make some changes. And it's been wonderful to hear all the other speakers today in terms of how we kind of think about transportation planning and health. Um, because obesity is uh, a symptom, but it is causing a lot of other problems. 
So I'm, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to click play and then I'll be able to animation prayerfully, that will take you through 20 years of the obesity epidemic and its impact on diabetes. That's 1994. Blue state, red state. I know Senator Rose left, but this is not what you want to see. Okay? Anybody alarmed by this? That 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 is a direct correlation to just bad behavior choices impacting actual health. We have a diabetes epidemic now, right here in our region that we're trying to grapple with. So what do we do about that? Well, part of what we've learned in public health and in healthcare in general is that we obviously have spent our money in the wrong place. So we gotta start to redistribute some of that so that we can get at some of these issues because we've learned that simply pumping money into the healthcare system doesn't actually equal better health outcomes for people. We have to start addressing all of these things in tandem to move the needle for folks. So, I'm going to put two of those things together, which really is the, uh, the crux of this presentation. So I know physical environment is only 10%, <clears throat> but I'm actually going to combine that with health behaviors because three decades of research have taught us <clears throat> excuse me, something else that's very important. Our physical environment directly impacts our ability to make healthy choices. It's not always about wanting to be healthier. It's about, do we live in an area, are we able to get to services and goods that help us to be healthy? So when you put physical environment and health behavior choice together, that's 40% of whether or not we're gonna be healthy as individuals and as communities. So before I go any further, thank you for all the work that you do, because I think many of you probably knew this all along, that how we lay out our roads, how we plan our communities, makes a huge impact in terms of the <coughs> lives, the actual lives of the people that live there. So we know this, it's not just me, the uh, strange guy out of place from public health telling you this, the World Health Organization, this is just a smattering of things, have identified the physical and built environment as a huge driver of health and our ability to make healthy choices. Certainly we need safe, clean air and water. We're actually doing really well in our region for that. And you've heard Senator Rose talk about that. Affordable, reliable public transit. I'm going to steal one of Jason's lines here. One of the questions that we ask ourselves is, are we creating, probably without even knowing it, a society where the, the cost of getting in the game, the market for a job, for services, for a better life, is to own a car? I think probably all of us probably drove a car here today. There are a lot of people who A, can't afford a car on a regular basis, or, like myself, love public transit, would like to have more tra public transit options. So that's a key driver, healthy workplaces. Look, health happens between our doctors. Meetings. You know, I had my, my annual checkup in January, my doctor told me I gained a couple more pounds than he'd like to see, he gave me a bunch of things I needed to do, said, God bless you, I'll see you in a year. What I do in that year is going to dictate my health. So what my workplace offers for me, how healthy it is, how I get to my workplace, and I'll talk about that in a second. Active transportation is a big deal. Access to fresh foods, I'm going to talk a lot about that. I'll touch on that. Designing our, own, our roads universally. Uh, and again, I, I'll say I'm not a planner, I'm not a transportation expert, so I'm a little bit of a fish out of water, but I do know that it impacts health. How interconnected are our neighborhoods? The CDC came out with an interesting study that looked at uh, cul-de-sac style neighborhoods, so they call them lollipops, I don't know if that's the actual term, um, versus traditional cities, older cities, that were drawn on grids. 
And it actually was fascinating when you actually think of what it takes for a kid to get to a school that's probably less than 2.5 miles, 0.25 miles from their house, but if they live in a cul-de-sac, they, cul they have to go out, get to the main drag, catch a bus, the bus has to take them down here to get back to the school, whereas in a neighborhood that has a grid, they just walk two blocks up the street. So it's, in, it's amazing how the way we, we draw our neighborhoods actually dictate our health. And things like safe and affordable housing, obviously. So this is not just a Northeast Ohio and Ohio and United States issue. This is a world issue in terms of planning and moving people to and from how that impacts health. Good news is there are lots of places, including here, where some pretty amazing things are happening. And I think some have already been touched on today, even in the stuff that ODOT is doing about engaging communities. So I want to talk about a few, but by no means is this a exhaustive list. You probably know way more than I do about it. So first I'm going to talk about Seattle Department of Transportation. So these are, these are areas, I should say, that are held up as examples in public health. They may not be in transportation. I, I, I can get that. But in terms of public health, we look at some of these communities and say, hey, what if we could do something like that? So in the mid-90s, Seattle asked 30 you know, neighborhoods to, to draft plans in conjunction with the city and, and planning organizations submit them to city council that identify key concerns and what they wanted to do about it. 35 of the 37 plans that were introduced identified pedestrian problems as their number one concern. Not economic development, not even the schools. It was how they could walk to all of those places. They didn't feel they could. So, the Seattle Department of Transportation, city council, the administrations, multiple administrations decided to implement these plans as best they could. Over 10 years, they created an integrated network of pedestrian, cycling, and vehicle travel. So not, hey, if you like bikes, we've got a bike path for you over here. If you like to walk, we have this trail over here. And if you drive to work, you have your roads. They did it together. So I have a few pictures. You can kind of see how some of the roads are set up. And this is uh, an example of sort of pedestrian-friendly um, areas of Seattle. But interesting thing. Now, 8,000 Seattle residents every day bicycle to work. Thousands more will hop on a public transit bus with their bike, get a little bit closer, pop out, get on one of these bike lanes, and get there at work. Thousands more walk to their work. So, the other thing I hear a lot is, well, James, people who like to bike, they have their bike stuff, but there aren't enough people who like to ride their bike to necessitate this level of of change. Seattle had less than 10% of people riding bikes in the city. It really was just the true believers. Over 10 years, novice bike riding has gone through the roof. Now almost half the residents of Seattle own a bike and use it at some point during the week to get to a place because they feel safe. They feel safe enough to do it. So it's the old, if you build it, they will come. So I'm going to take you way out from a big metropolitan area to a rural town in uh, eastern Colorado. So like many communities who want to do something about these issues, you think about, okay, well, one big problem is we don't have access to physical activity. People just can't get active. So Ray, Colorado actually built a state-of-the-art fitness center. Guess what? Nobody used it. So. About a decade in, they were like, what are we going to do? Because we have this huge asset that no one's using, and we don't know why. So they engaged residents, and come to find out that residents didn't want to go to a central facility. They wanted something smaller, something accessible, right in their neighborhood. Their kids had playgrounds. They could get to the school playground, which was shared use. But there was nothing for adults. Adults aren't going to go up and go down the slides and all that good stuff. So together with the hospital, the, the planning organizations, community members, and city council and the, gov and the government there, they launched what was called the RAI Health Initiative, or RAI, excuse me, Health Initiative, where they actually built small indoor and outdoor fitness areas. So it could be as little as a pull-up bar that's just smack down right there in the middle of the neighborhood, but it's prompts all along the way, or Tai Chi for seniors, they started to do programming in the neighborhoods, not at the fitness center, in the neighborhoods to utilize the equipment. Walking tracks, 
biking tracks. And you see a little picture there of, you know, Ray walks the world and, and everybody got the, you know, on board. Now here's one disclaimer I'll say. This doesn't work for every community. So there's a big, that's why I picked Seattle and Ray. Ray's a small rural community, all sort of similar socioeconomic status, all sort of similar uh, demographically, and had significant success. This probably, probably, would not have been as successful if Seattle and Rick Large had decided to do this. So Seattle did what its neighborhoods asked it to do. But the responsiveness uh, is yielding. In only three years, they've seen a significant decrease in the maps that you just saw of diabetes and obesity. Because people didn't want to drive to the fitness center. They wanted to walk to something they could do right there in their neighborhood. Quick 30 minutes, get back to their kids, their families, and be done. Well, we're doing some things right here. Uh, one of the things that we've been engaged in for quite some time now, about a year and a half, is something called Health and All Policies. Simply put, it's in, the, it's in the title, we're just trying to create a movement where health is a chief consideration in every decision that's made in terms of planning and, and uh, really any decision that government makes. But we didn't want to push a particular issue. You know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with Complete Streets, and I'll actually talk about a workshop that we're going to have. We could have gone out and just said, let's all get on board for Complete Streets. But we have no <coughs> idea if that's what residents really are looking for. So we spent an entire year just talking to Summit County residents all over the place. In Akron, in uh, I see Talmadge, in fact, we did Talmadge Forum. We were all over suburbs, rural, urban, asking people, what matters to you? We asked very simple questions. What brings you joy in your life? What is a barrier to joy? What do you like about your neighborhood? What don't you like? Very simple, direct questions. And it's amazing because almost everybody answered them the same way. The only thing that was different was the built environment. Depending on where you live in Summit County, you either said that the built environment was one of the best things about living in your city, your community, or the worst. And I put two pictures to describe that. So this is our wonderful Highway Erie Canal towpath. You live in the, you know, next to that or you use it, or you had a wonderful city park and rec, more likely people said, we love it, we want more of it. If you didn't live there, you more likely said that I have a real hard time just in my daily life because of the physical environment around me. And one of the biggest ones was snow. So we've talked about salt and things of that nature, and I, that's something, again, I, I applaud everybody. I don't even know how I would go about doing that. But what I can tell you is that not plowing sidewalks and unplowed streets or insufficiently plowed streets was the biggest concern of urban responders, and we had quite a few, about 500 urban responses. Now, we can't do anything about the snow, and I know some folks would say, well, you know, a lot of communities have enforcement, right? They have policies that say people are supposed to clear the sidewalk. We all know that that doesn't always happen. So what's the actual life impact of that? We didn't have the data to really delve down. I can only give you anecdotal stories, but I can tell you I, we spoke with a mother who didn't actually get to the grocery store for three days and had to deal with whoever could get to her to bring her and her baby food, which ended up being our Help Me Grow home visitors because of the snow. She didn't have a car. She couldn't get to the, to the bus stop. We have this an awful lot. In fact, Akron is becoming, this is becoming a real issue of kids getting hit while walking in the roads trying to get to school. Um, it's a big issue for people. It actually impacts their lives. And so we, it's a real deal when we talk about how we're going to get salt and how we're going to do these things. Real people, every day, are seeing this as a barrier to just living. Whereas people, where we really have great infrastructure, people are saying, it's the one thing that I really love, it really gets me up and going, it's just where I live. So that's, that's a big difference. We have a lot of local successes we can point to, so I, I want to give huge amounts of credit to AMAT's road diet study. I mean, us in public health, we love road diets. I, I know that a lot of communities don't. Um, I learned that over the summer. Andy Davis and I did a little road trip, and some communities loved it. Others wanted no part of it. So I get that. Uh, but that's out there, and that's a wonderful piece that we can now work on. We talked about safe routes to school. 
Akron has a wonderful program that's going. We did a great uh, experiment in Akron North Hill with the Better Block. That's a picture here of a, of a temporary buffer bike lane uh, that was utilized. I did it, and I don't even ride a bike. Um, full disclosure. So that's a great one. We have an amazing regional trail system. We don't have, I don't have to tell you that. Our towpath, our freedom trails, the trails that were in our, our neighborhoods are amazing. And there's a lot of work being done to connect them up. The only thing I will say about that is that simply building a neighborhood connecting trail doesn't mean you solve the issue. We found that this summer we were in the Edgewood neighborhood in Akron at the zoo talking about the towpath connector that's going to come through that neighborhood. The community were very clear that they didn't see that as for them. That's for other people who live in the city to come to the zoo. That's not for me. You're not building that for me. And so that was a real thing where we had to say, okay, we've got to go back to the drawing board here. It's not enough just to say we're going to build a, a wonderful trail for your neighborhood. People have to be involved in that process. They've got to feel like they, that's for them. Open streets. So Knight Foundation, City of Akron, closed down huge, many miles of, uh, of Main Street all the way through North Hill down into downtown to see what would happen, and sure enough, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people showed up to bike up and down it, to walk, we had vendors. Again, one day, but it was an experiment to show that people really like it when you put that stuff out there. We actually have an incredible worksite wellness uh, program going on, actually programs in Summit County, Portage County, all the, a lot of employers are buying into that, and that's wonderful. In our park system, you know, we have the Condor Valley National Park in our backyard, so many of the local townships, villages, municipalities have amazing parks and rec systems. You should know your residents love it, and they've told us that. We just need to replicate it, because again, not everybody thinks that they can get there. With all those successes, we have a lot of challenges. I really thought about this slide, because we, we have a lot of challenges. And what I didn't want to do, and what oftentimes happens when I talk, is that people feel like it's on them to change it. It's on all of us. We all have a piece of the puzzle. So instead of putting up a ton of information, I just put this map up, because I'm going to talk about the map. This map is the food desert map for Summit County. Food deserts can be measured many different ways. We choose to use the USDA measure, which is if you live outside, of a one mile radius of a large retail grocer, and you live in an area that's 20% or more poverty, you live in a food desert. So what you see here, and I mean, the one thing we can say in public health, we know where all the food establishments are because we regulate them. But I'll tell you one that's not up here and why that's important. So large retail grocer would be your Giant Eagles, your Acme's, you know, those type of things, your save a lots. It's not gonna capture um, what some people say is true access, which would be like a corner store, but I'll tell you why that we don't do that in a minute. This is where you can get, basically, fresh produce, right? So this is the map of, of Summit County. And the, the areas in tan are your food deserts. You obviously can see your grocery stores in the one mile radius around, uh, estimated around that uh, grocery store. One that's not up here, because this map's about four or five months old, is the mustard seed market. It's about right there in Anchor. Just by putting that store, we all know it took like a long time to get that there. It's going to wipe out a significant portion there. Now again, just like a trail or a bike lane, simply putting in a grocery store doesn't mean you solve the hunger issue in that neighborhood, but you wouldn't even be able to begin if that infrastructure didn't exist. So I put up here that significant health and social disparities still remain in our region and place matters. So if I put up a map that showed you the diabetes, where diabetes was a big problem, it's the same map. If I put up where obesity is a problem, it's the same map. If I put up where uh, infant mortality is high, it's the same map. If I put up where people are having a hard time or their commutes are two hours or more, it's the same map. It's the same map. And so that is telling us in public health that we can attack all some of these other social determinants, and we are, you know, in terms of making sure that, uh, you know, people feel included in economic development, they have an opportunity to get a job, they have an opportunity to get an education, those type of things. 
We can do that, and certainly there are lots of people all over our region that are doing that. But if we don't actually change the places within where people live, we won't actually solve the problem. And if we can't improve how people get to places, we won't actually solve the problem. So it's, we, we're doing a lot, but we still do have a ways to go. So again, I started as I'll end that we are, as human beings, only as healthy as the environment around us. And I think if we all took a moment and thought about our neighborhood, our house, the neighbors we have, where our kids go to school, you know, where we go to work, we see that. We know the places in our communities that are struggling more than others. That's nothing new. But what we have found is that if we don't partner more with transportation and with planning organizations and vice versa, we aren't going to solve some of these issues. So I thank you for the work you do. We want to be more partners with you because we have figured out maybe what you've already always known, which is that transportation and planning organizations in so many ways, the decisions that they make, impact the real lives and the health outcomes of people for decades and decades to come. So with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Thanks. <laughs> wow, was that riveting. <laughs> so funding, question, funding. So that's good. My unit, the Health Equity and Social Determinants Unit, is only eight months old. So this is pretty new for public health, and there's only one other such unit in the entire state of Ohio, and that's at Columbus Public Health. Pretty lucky to have a group of people who are waking up every day trying to think about how we can partner with y'all to make people's lives better. We do that because we have funding. So um, federal government has set aside an enormous amount of money for communities to get involved and start moving the needle on some of these more non-traditional aspects of health. What we've done with that money uh, has been, I think, pretty progressive. So we are not the experts, you are. So uh, one of the grants we were able to receive through the CDC that was given to the American Planning Association. We are a sub-grantee, one of only a handful in the country. So we partnered with, and I know Jerry's here, there he is. We partnered with the Akron Chapter APA, Ohio APA, and put in a great proposal to really start to think about how we can promote complete streets policies, the link between transportation planning and health. We're doing um, nutrition around food access and really looking at where our markets are going. The farmers markets are great. I love going to Howe Meadow, but Summit Lake ain't going to Howe Meadow. So we put the farmers market in Summit Lake. So doing some of those things, but we do, this is very new for national public health. And CDC uh, isn't in use to having to deal with diabetes. They're used to dealing with Ebola. So how they're using the funds is gonna evolve over time, but yes, there's funding. Our philosophy is we need to get it in the hands of people who know how to do this work. We're, we're also helping Andy Davis. Many of you probably know Andy. Andy's over at the University of Akron now. He's at the Active Transportation Guru. So we help to support Andy so that he can be out in the community helping to speak the language that I can't speak, to talk about why this is important and also to get us in the door so we can hear from you, you can hear from us, and we can make better decisions. So there's funding, but unfortunately, as of right now, we don't have direct funding to like pay for a bike lane or pay for you know, those type of things. We can do a farmer's market, but my hope is that in years to come, we would have actual dollars. Now there's Safe Routes to School. Safe Routes to School program is putting the real dollars to make real infrastructure changes to make it easier for kids and parents to walk to school. In fact, the picture I had up there was of our walking school bus program to get more kids walking to school. So there's lots of money, but how it can be used is still very, uh, a lot of strings tied to it. Yes? Hi, James, we heard you and Andy Davis uh, speak in the Barberton Norton Copley area on the same subject. Do you go around and meet with the communities individually, with the community leaders, and give them like a, an audit of their community? Food deserts and what do you think about that? That's a great question. So the question is, we, Andy Davis, and like I said, did a little uh, road trip over the summer and tried to try this out, basically, to see how it was going to go. Yes, we are available to come into the community. We have more data than 
you'll ever think we have. Uh, we can do maps, we can do all that, you know, we can get into the nitty gritty. Uh, so the answer is yes, we can do that, and we would love to. Uh, I do want to make a plug too that while we can come to you, you can also come to us on November 10th at Summit County Public Health, and I believe you're going to get an invitation, and Amnes is even going to maybe help us put it on the website. November 3rd. November, um, November. November 10th, we're going to do a Complete Streets workshop. For anyone who's interested in learning more about Complete Streets, we're going to be doing that uh, at Summit County Public Health. So you'll get information about that. Yes, we will come wherever you would like us to come and talk about your community or the decision you have. In fact, I will give a plug to our friends at Metro who uh, are in the process of doing a DOT health impact assessment and really just needed some help to go through this data, this health data that they aren't used to, just like I'm not used to transportation data. So by putting our minds together, I think we ended up with a better survey and some better results. So we're more than happy to partner. Yes, ma'am. How did you see the uh, Kent State School Public Health partnering with local communities? Say again? How, how could the Kent State School Public Health partner with local communities? Great question. So how can Kent State College of Public Health partner with local communities? So I'm a product, proud, and I know that they would love to do that. So you have a gem of a public health program with professors that are more than willing to be your consultants uh, on projects. So you don't always have to come to us or even to your local health department. By all means, and I'd be happy to provide you with some names, but they are always looking for opportunities to help communities, and here's the other thing too, they have students who need to get practicums done, and they're bright, and they need placements, and so you'd be amazed at what one student can do for your community in looking at an issue. James, James do you have, uh, you alluded to some of this in your presentation, but do you have some next steps that the health department is planning on embarking on, kind of vis-a-vis -vis, uh, community, layout, planning, transportation, or and or things that you would like to see um, a group like the AMATS or local government kind of prioritize? So health and all policies is wonderful but unenforceable, right? So we can get lots of local governments to sign on to the charter. And uh, even if we had some enforcing capabilities, which we don't, it would be really difficult because at the end of the day, decisions have to be made, and we totally get that. If I had a crystal ball, I would love to see a real formal partnership between uh, public health and local governments and organizations like AMATS, and AMATS has been a wonderful partner, in thinking through the issues. We get it. We're not coming in there saying you can't put that road there. We know at the end, ultimate, at the end of the day, you gotta make decisions, but let's talk about it. Let's, let's see what the residents think. Let's really take some of this literature that we know, you know is true and see if we can move the needle. Look, we, we, at the end of the day, the biggest stat that drives me nuts in Summit County, and I can only speak to Summit County's numbers, is that we have folks who are dying, some of them a decade before they should, simply because of where they live. Now, we could take issue with, I know some folks have taken issue with me making that statement. Certainly, personal choice goes into that, but as I try to illustrate, not everybody can make the choices that we would want them to make or that we would make ourselves, simply because of where they live, their ability to access service, just to get, just to get on a bus and get to a place in a reasonable amount of time to keep a job. That's, that frightens me. So I think that what I'd like to see is that we know that it's not, a, it's not an end-all be-all, but if we can figure out a way of embracing the assets that we have, and I think we do a good job of that, but clearly what I've found is that not everybody thinks those assets are for them, so how do we change that? How do we create an environment where there's no wrong door? If you want to make a healthy choice, you can do it. As our health commissioner says, not everybody's going to drink the Kool-Aid, but you should have the ability to drink it if you want. So we are always going to have obesity problem, we're always going to have, you know, uh, diabetes, that's always going to exist. But the level at which it's existing cannot persist. There's just not enough money in the system to take care of all the, the stuff that we're doing to ourselves. So part of it is help, we would love to see communities, and we would like to work with communities, 
to help move the needle on whatever it is their community chooses it wants to attack first. You know, we did a safe house to school meeting, same neighborhood at Edgewood. Everybody wants their kid to, to walk to school. But the roads weren't the issue. It was safety. So you don't know that unless you get out there and you talk to folks. So that's why I always like to not prescribe things. I can come here and say, complete streets for everyone. That won't solve the problem completely if, the, if those streets are unsafe. So every community has its own challenges. And I believe in every community, no matter what, has a challenge. My, my belief, what I'd like to see, is that we collaborate on those challenges figure out the infrastructure issues, but then figure out more importantly what each community needs to be successful in their own health and start with that. It's like the Ray example. I'm sure those community leaders felt really good about building that health, that state-of-the-art health facility that no one went to. But when they engage the community, they build a network of systems and health, um, health choices that actually move the needle. I want to actually move the needle for health communities to do that. I think the only way we do that is through partnering, getting outside of our comfort zones, and really listening to residents in terms of what health means to them, not necessarily what it means to me or to us. Okay. okay. Uh, well, we're all busy. Yeah. And I just wondered if part of your strategy is to help us identify healthy food that's fast. So we could enter that into our consideration. Uh, more and more people are working at their desk. Um, you take the easy solution through the drive-through. I'm just wondering um, if that's part of your strategy. Yeah, so the question was how can we increase, I think, uh, healthy options that are fast and affordable so folks that are busy can make better choices. Yes, we would love to do that. A lot of times, though, that's beyond our control. So, again, making healthful decisions. I'm not an expert in planning and economic development, although I claim to be, but how many dollar stores do we really need? I mean, you gotta start to think about those things and say, would it be good to maybe see if there's an investment opportunity or economic development opportunity for a healthful, fast, affordable place to put in there instead of maybe another dollar store? Um, so those are the types of decisions that build an infrastructure for people to have those options. Certainly within work environments, again, I think we're very progressive in terms of trying to get worksite wellness together and where every day we get better. But I'm the same way. If I got a choice between McDonald's, and McDonald's is the only way, the only thing on my stop from A to B, chances are, and I know it going in, that I'm going to make that choice. So if I had better options, I'd probably make a better choice. The other thing I want to say about it is, I think Senator Bill Rose was right. And again, he and I are the same generation, so it's easy for us to say that. But you know, when I think about my kids, my family, I live in Akron. I love living in Akron. Wouldn't miss it. I like the grid streets. I run them. Um, my kids walk to school because I make them. Um, but most of the people in our neighborhood don't. But I also can walk to the little shop, the little neighborhood business district, it's right down the street from me. And in that business district, there is a pizza shop. But there's also you know, a Starbucks, there's a, uh, there's a little carryout place that has fresh stuff, like fresh cut um, fruit in the mornings. So when I'm busy, I only have 15 minutes of, of flex time before I gotta be at work, I have a choice. And more often than not, I didn't this morning, I choose the fruit because it's there. But I also live in an environment urban environment where I simply walk down, when I wake up in the morning, get my fruit, come back, and I'm done. Let's think about our communities, and can everybody say they can do that? So I think part of building um, um, healthy, fast options is also making sure that people can access them in a, in a quick way. Um, I can walk down there, but if I lived in maybe a different community, I'd have to drive or something like that, and that, that extra time just wouldn't work. Does that answer your question? I actually have a comment to that, yeah. because I used to just get up in the morning, go to work, and come 12, 12.30, I'm hungry, and then I decide, well, should I go to Wendy's, Burger King, Arby's, or whatever. And that's that decision-making, that daily decision-making is also stressful, because you have to try to find out where to eat, to help me. I changed it. Put together a salad in the morning in a bowl, put the lid on, 
Take an apple, take a banana, buy a pound of turkey lunch meat on Sunday, and make every morning a, a turkey sandwich. And I do the same lunch every day, and I don't have to decide where to eat at 12 30. Absolutely. And God bless if you live in a place where you can get all those things in a reasonable amount of time. But there are communities where that is not possible. So I think it's, again, it's again an infrastructure thing. You're like, you're absolutely right. I know I should pack my lunch. We all should. But I'm fortunate enough where I live within 25 miles of an end. So I just drive there real quick, get it, I'm done. There are places, mainly, you saw the map in Akron. That is not possible uh, for a lot of people. And a lot of it is transportation options. Uh, a lot of it is just there isn't a grocery store around. There's a corner store that doesn't sell any of that. In fact, the first thing you see when you walk in is cigarettes and alcohol. So, um, talk about preying on people, you know, I mean, we can get in a whole conversation about that. So, again, place matters. So, you're absolutely right that I should do this. Thank you so much. I appreciate you.